find our people that we're reading about and studying in First and Second Peter. It was through persecution that they were driven out. And as they were going, churches were planted. It's the mission. Because you see, our Christianity is who we are. It defines us. And so wherever we go, we make an impact. We have an influence because we live as Christ would live. And others see that, and they inquire about it. And that's the calling that we have. Our lives will be measured in light of the Great Commission. Are we making disciples? That's an important question for us as a church and for each of us as individuals. It's important for us in our workplace. It's important for us to think about in our families. Are we making disciples? of those that God places in front of us and around us. We have a responsibility to be about the mission. That's what Jesus' final words were to His church. As you are going, make disciples, teaching them to observe all these things. That's what Paul's saying in essence. Be followers of me, as I am of Christ. That's the mission. Here's what I want us to understand. Before we go any further this morning, I want us to understand this very important. And it's, I, I hope it stands out to you because it is very startling at first when we think about it. But here's what you need to understand. We are living in disobedience unless we are living life with others and pointing them to Christ. Do you hear me, church? We are living in disobedience to God's calling in our life, unless we're living life with others and pointing them to Christ. God's never called us to cloister and hide. He's called us to, as we are going, make disciples. And when we don't do that, that's called disobedience. You might say, well, I, I don't know have the words to say. Well, we can get somebody to help you with the words to say. But listen to what Paul says. Be followers of me as I am of Christ. It's that simple. If you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and you have the opportunity to read His Word and to understand His Word, to be taught underneath the teaching of His Word, you are being taught the ways in which to live like Christ. It then becomes as simple as obeying and applying the truth to my life, and then others will see how that truth impacts my life, and they will learn how to follow Christ as well. Now, sure, we have to tell them about the gospel. We have to go into those things. But it begins with being those who follow Him so that others can learn to follow Him as well. Now, looking back in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, what I want you to see here is the constant. That's the mission. The mission is we're to make disciples. But there is a constant that's here. And it's found in the very first phrase, be imitators of me. And the word be imitators and in, in not to get boring Greek lesson here, but it's in the imperative tense. That means it's a command. It's imperative. It's not optional. Here's what you are to do. You, Corinthians, are to be imitators of me. It's not an optional thing. We are to follow him, and then others will follow him through us. We're to be constantly be imitators of Christ and of those who follow Christ. Not only is it imperative, but it's also present tense, meaning that it's an ongoing, always, 24-7, 365 days a year. There is no vacation from being one who follows, who mimics, who imitates Christ so that others can imitate Christ. It's a constant thing. This isn't the only place that Paul has said this. Look over, if you will, um, or back in, in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 4, 
1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. He said the same thing. He says, therefore, I exhort you, be imitators of me. In Philippians, in Philippians chapter 3, he, he tells the Philippian believers a very similar thing. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. He says, brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. In other words, we're to constantly be looking to those who follow Christ and pattern our lives after theirs as they follow Christ. And Paul constantly reminds them of this. It's an ongoing imperative. It's an ongoing, non-optional thing that we have in our lives. We are to be imitators of Christ. Also in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, here's what he says. These things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. See, Paul was never a preacher who separated himself from the message. He understood he had a responsibility as he taught, he was to live. And as he lived, he was to teach. He had to set himself up as an example to the followers that here's how you live out the truth of Jesus Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. That's the mission. It's that simple. And it begins with that spiritual strength of seeking him and his righteousness. Here's what we have to understand here this morning. Here's what we're being asked in living life before those who observe us. We are to view our daily activities not as mundane routines of life, but as opportunities for kingdom impact. You see, we, we, we really don't know what is going to touch somebody's life. We don't know everybody that's watching and observing because every aspect of life to one degree or another is under the observance of somebody else. Now, I grant it that, uh, you know, as a pastor, you live in a fishbowl sometimes, and everybody watches you, and that can be uncomfortable. But it's only as uncomfortable as your life not matching up with your message. See, when you have nothing to hide, it's easy for others to observe. Now, we, we know that there's no perfection, and I don't think anybody expects perfection. Paul wasn't perfect. But here's what he said. Follow my example. Watch my day-to-day -day activities. See my priorities. See what I do, how I respond in tough situations. Follow my example as I follow Christ. Paul's not talking about perfection here. But what he is talking about is the application of message to life in such a way that it is lived in a way that others see Christ and know how to live for Christ because of the way they observe you live. It's a critical question for us to be asking. Look back on 2015. Do people see you as a follower of Christ? Or do they see you as something else? Would they know that you're a Christian by the way that you've interacted with them? Would they know who Christ is because of the time that they spent with you? That's the question that God is asking us to consider. Because all of our daily activities, every moment, has been redeemed by God for His purpose, for His mission. So all our daily activities, none of them are mundane or routine. You know, the day we had the snow, I was meeting somebody at Applebee's. It was a great sacrifice because I really don't like Applebee's. But as I was coming out from lunch, 
this young lady was turning in. Apparently, she worked at Applebee's, God bless her. And uh, so she was turning in, and they had done a good job in plowing the entrance there. And as she came up into the parking lot, that here in Derry, the Applebee's drive kind of goes up. She got stuck right in the snow. It's snowing like crazy. There's cars going all around. So I see her stuck. And I think, oh, man, I got to get some. Okay. So I get out, and I start pushing and pushing. I'm getting absolutely nowhere. And we're pushing, and we're rocking back and forth. And there's snow splashing up all over me and, and whatnot. And no, nobody's there. And we're just about 10, 15 minutes. And finally, she gets out, and she goes, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, I noticed. And then she said, well, i got some friends on the inside. I can go ask them if they can help. I said, that'd be great. She gets out of the car. She starts to run. And she turns around and she says, I don't know who you are, but you're the nicest person ever. <laughs> now, reality is on the inside, I'm grumbling. Why are all these people driving by? Well, can't somebody just stop and help? we got a person that needs help. Ooh, that hurts. <laughs> have to be careful. There's stitches there and everything. But, you know, just, just to get out, you never do. Just to get out and help. Just to show the love of Christ in a small way. It's not that hard. It's not that complicated. Sometimes all it is is just simply being Christ in the moment. And that's what God calls us to. Everyday activities need to be captured for the cause of Christ. Now, there's a responsibility that's communicated here that I want us to see. And there's three concepts that I want us to grab a hold of. First of all, as we are seeing here, there's the imitation principle that's part of this responsibility. And here's what Paul's saying. Simply put, be imitators of me just as I am of Christ. Here's what he's saying. We need to be mentors of those, that is, that those that come into our sphere of influence. And that means that there will be those that we point to Christ. We are going to be mentors of them. We're going to point them to Christ. That's what he's talking about. Be followers, be imitators of me. He's demonstrating the imitation principle that we are to be mentors. We're to come alongside of. That's what he said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Follow my example. Live life the way that I'm living as I follow Christ. And so we're going to need mentors like the Apostle Paul. We need people who are going to come into our lives and show us how to live. But we also need to be those who will be showing others how to live. Every one of us in here has the responsibility to be a mentor, showing others Christ, and a mentee being shown how to live like Christ. We are to live life together as community. This is one of the reasons why we do small groups. We want to come alongside of each other and iron sharpening iron and pointing each other to Christ. Calling us up short when we're falling short and encouraging us when we need to be encouraged. But living life together in a way that we are pointing each other to Christ. And sometimes we'll be in the position of they're following us. And sometimes we'll be in the position of we're following them. But all along we are living life together and we're seeking to live as Christ would have us. That's the imitation principle. Follow me as I follow Christ. There's been many occasions in my life when somebody would say, well, Pastor Tally, what do we do about this? I don't know. Well, how do you respond to that? I don't know. So there's going to be times when we don't know. And we may have to turn to somebody else. But that's the way God's designed it for us. That's the imitation principle. We need to be involved in walking alongside of others, and we need to be walking alongside of others. And that's the imitation principle. Think of a couple of passages here. Look in, in Paul's letters to his protégés, Timothy and Titus, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. I should say 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Here's what Paul says to young Timothy. 
He says this, These things, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's that principle. Take what you've learned from me, Timothy, and you give that to other men, Timothy, so that they will be able to teach other men. It's the imitation principle. It's what means to be making disciples. In Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2 in verse 1, we'll just pick it up there. Listen to these verses. Titus chapter 2 verse 1, it says, But as for you, speak the things, Paul talking to Titus, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in the faith, and love and in perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. Why? So that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husband, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible, and in all things show yourself to be an example of the good deeds with purity and in doctrine and dignify and sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. All through this passage, the senior man Paul is talking to the junior man Titus and saying, listen, Here's what you need to do. Teach the older women to come alongside of the younger men and the older uh, younger women and the older men to come alongside of the younger men and teach them how to live Christ-like. And then he says, Titus, and you also be on guard how you live your life so that they will be able to see your example. And nobody will be able to question your example. That's the imitation principle. But there's also a creation principle that's talked about. Paul uses this in in Ephesians. Look there with me, if you will. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Listen to what he says here. We'll pick it up in verse 8. It's verses that we know. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. God saved you. Not a result of work so that anyone would boast. And then listen to the verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We've been created to walk in the way of Christ. And Paul emphasizes that over and over again. Look back in 2 Timothy as well. 2 Timothy chapter 2 this time, in verse 3 and 4, following right up on that verse 2, here's what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And he says this, No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. He's talking about being a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. So that's the creation principle. This is what you were created for. This is what God saved you for. He saved every one of us to walk in the ways of Christ, to be those that can be imitated as we follow Christ. That's what we were created for us in Christ Jesus That's why we say, if you don't do it, you're living in disobedience. This is what God created you for. This is what he called you to. But there's also the reward principle. We don't have time this morning. We could spend the rest of the day looking at these passages. But look back in Matthew, if you will, the reward that's talked about here. Matthew chapter 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount. We, several years ago, we we looked at uh, this passage of Scripture. Great, great sermon of Jesus Christ. And in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 10, 11, and 12, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, 11, and 12, listen to what our Savior says. This comes right on the heels of the Beatitudes. 
And he says this in verse 10, Blessed are those who have been persecuted. Very similar to what we hear in 1 Peter. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. In other words, they know you're following me and now they attack you because they resent the fact that you represent Christ. Everywhere you turn in the pages of the scriptures, what we are told to do is to be imitators of Christ. And others will observe that. Sometimes they will follow. But as we learn in 1 Peter, sometimes they will persecute. And Jesus is saying, they will say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And then listen to verse 12. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. There's the reward principle. Notice one more passage in, in chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. And then we'll look also at verse 16 through 20 of chapter 6. Here's what it says. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Now here's where we have to make a very important point. There's a difference between being an example that others can follow and living life so that others will notice. You see, if we're pointing others to Christ, we're not asking them to look at us and to say, see, see what I am, look how great I am. That's not what this is about. He says, they're doing it for the glory of man, not the glory of God. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven, verse 1. Verse 2, so when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their full reward. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, and so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. They're showing off. Truly, I say to you, they have their full reward. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. We could go to passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 3 about the different building materials that we can, we can go to Colossians chapter 3 and Revelation chapter 11. We can go to all those passages, but each one of them talks about the fact that God will reward those who are faithful in serving Him regardless of whether people follow or don't. All we have is the responsibility to live in such a way that they see Christ. And to be ready to give an answer like we were told in 1 Peter when they see you living that way. That's the reward principle. Here's what I want to say to us. When Bible studies become an end and not a means to an end, then we are not living out the mission of building Christ's kingdom we're just distracted by Christian busy work. That's what you see about the hypocrites. They're doing everything for show. They're keeping themselves busy. They're doing all the right things. But it's not about building his kingdom. It's not about pointing people to Christ. It's about pointing them to us. We're to be about him and his righteousness and his kingdom. And that's why I think it's important as we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that we see that Paul makes this emphasis and he makes it very clear. He's not saying be followers of me. Do what I do because I'm all that and great and everything else and I'm just a wonderful person so follow me. But in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1 he gives us the standard. And the standard is this. Be imitators of me just as I also am Christ. That's the standard. We can think of nothing else that we should be living for but to point others to Christ. He is the one we pattern our lives after, and He is the one who we point others to by the way that we live those lives after that pattern. That's the mission, plain and simple. Can we get better at explaining the gospel? Yes. 
Can we do things that will give us opportunities to explain the gospel? Yes, but hear me very well. Unless we are living out the truth of the gospel, they will not listen, or the message that they will get will be confusing. You see, we're to be about the mission. Be followers of me as I am of Christ. The question is, are we committed to that? Are we committed to the mission? That's the question. And here's a final thought that I want to give you, is that being committed to the mission means that our lives must be structured in such a way that we point others to Christ. We point them to Christ. This past summer, I was golfing with some guys. I can't remember who it was. And we were out golfing, and we were on a new golf course. We were trying to figure out where the pin was that we had to hit to. And we saw this pin out there, and he said, okay, that must be where we're to hit. And so I was the guy who was leading off. So I get up, and I get my driver out, and I hit this wonderful drive. It just goes forever, it seems like. It was what, it, if there had been a time for it to hook or do a bend, this would have been the time. But I hit it straight as an arrow, and it's flying out there, and it's going straight at that flag. And I'm going like, wow, this is awesome. And everybody else behind me is going like, oh, my. Feeling pretty good. And they all get up and they hit towards the flag and I'm feeling really good because now mine's still the farthest one. First one to hit straight at the flag. They're all over the place. We start down the fairway. And all of a sudden, about halfway down, we realize that's not the flag we're supposed to be hitting at. As a matter of fact, that's nowhere near the flag that we're supposed to be hitting at. And about 10 holes from now, we'll be hitting at that flag. The flag we're hitting at is over this way. Here's the question, Calvary Bible Church. Who are you pointing to? Where are you directing people with your lives? Are you taking them to the wrong flag, the wrong hole, the wrong place? Or are you taking them where they belong, which is Christ? That's the mission. Are we committed to that? In 2016, make it your prayer. I'm going to point people to Christ. I don't know exactly how to do that other than to live out the truth of the gospel in everyday life situations. I'm just going to make sure that I keep my eye on the flag, which is Christ, and I'm going to keep moving in that direction. And yeah, I may hook the ball left or right, I may, I may dribble it, I may dig up more ground on occasion, and I may humiliate myself in the process, but I'm going to keep going towards Christ because He is the only one that can fix life's mess. Let us not look back on 2016 and realize that we took people over here when they needed to go there. Make sure your directions are correct. Live Christ. Live in such a way that others see Christ in you and learn who Christ is because of you. Let's pray. Our God, we thankful. We are so thankful for all that you've done for us. We realize that you have set us free from sin and shame and you've made life eternal possible for us. That's a great gift. But help us to understand that you've left us here for a purpose so that others might learn who you are, that others might understand who your son is because of the way that we live our lives. We know that that's only going to happen through the power that works in us and through us that comes from you. So we need your spiritual strength. But help us to organize and structure our lives in such a way that we, that we truly, truly point others to Christ. Every moment 
of every day is an opportunity that you give us to show Christ. May that be our commitment in 2016. In Jesus' name we pray.